hello everybody. Welcome to Healing Outside the Box. This is episode 274, and I'm calling it, What is in Hydrosomonia Fertilizer, and Why Should We Care? I'm Jean Tiberio, and I'm a nutritionist and a wellness coach. I also happen to have a special interest in nutrition on a budget, since in the past I've worked with low-income populations. And why not talk about this now because, well, as I imagine you already know, food is getting more expensive. The starchy foods, like plain rice and pasta, are still a good deal for stretching your food dollar. But you can by far get the most nutrition for your dollar with what I call legumes. I love saying that word. Dr. Michael Greger put out a short video about the benefits of beans for, in this case, cardiovascular disease. I'll put a link to that video in the show notes. If beans in lentils work for cardiovascular disease, more than likely they're going to work for diabetes and high blood pressure as well. Now these household legumes are your beans, especially red beans, kidney beans, pinto beans, black beans, in terms of nutrition density for your buck, but also chickpeas and lentils. These foods are by far at the top of the nutrition per dollar list. They have lots of protein, fiber, antioxidants, lots of vitamins and minerals, and even anti-inflammatory substances. These beans and lentils help even out blood sugars to prevent or control diabetes. The fiber in them helps to slow down the digestion and absorption of the glucose which is the end product of complex carbohydrate metabolism. The antioxidants and anti-inflammatory substances help control risk of heart attacks and strokes. They also help control cholesterol, blood pressure, and weight. So if you're interested in some of my favorite bean recipes, just send me a note on my contact page on my website, which is Healing Outside the Box, and I'll email you some recipes. And these are foods that regular folks eat, you know, like bean burritos or hummus. Now, back to the topic of today's podcast. What is anhydrous ammonia fertilizer, and why should we care? Now, by the time I got through saying that long title, you may have already decided that you don't care. But hang tight, that is... If you've already finished watching A Wild Animal Get Rescued on YouTube, and you've had enough of your guilty pleasure cat and dog videos, let's start with a little history of how we got to use anhydrous ammonia as fertilizer on factory farms. After World War II, ammonium nitrate left over from ammunition's production was then given to farmers for fertilizer. Some guy thought of that. The fertilizer is made by pressurizing hydrogen gas and nitrogen gas under high heat to get anhydrous ammonia. The gaseous ammonia, under extreme pressure, can be liquefied and sprayed onto crops. This is used as a source of nitrogen on industrialized farms. By the way, it comes from fossil fuels, i.e. liquefied dinosaurs. Right now, the price of nitrogen fertilizers is directly related to the price of natural gas. Manufacturing one ton of anhydrous ammonia fertilizer requires 33,500 cubic feet of natural gas. It sounds like a lot. In fact, I don't know how many beans you'd have to eat to produce that much gas, but probably a lot. Now, the cost of this represents most of the cost associated with manufacturing this anhydrous ammonia. And yes, we have to drill our fertilizer out of the Earth's core. Okay, that's the cost in climate change problems. But what about the safety? As you may be guessing, concentrated ammonia is toxic stuff. It is defined as follows. This is a quote from the CDC. Quote, ammonia is a toxic gas or liquid that, when concentrated, is corrosive to tissues upon contact. Exposure to ammonia in sufficient quantities 
can be fatal. Close quote. Here's another quote from CDC. Quote, Ammonia can be absorbed into the body by inhalation, ingestion, eye contact, and skin contact. Ingestion is an uncommon route of exposure. Close quote. Ammonia can be released into outdoor air as a liquid spray or aerosol and as a vapor. Here's another quote from the CDC. If ammonia is released into the air as a liquid spray, it has the potential to contaminate agricultural products. I'll give you the link to the article where I'm getting all of this. Now, they go on to say this gas-like chemical as potentially one of the most dangerous chemicals used on the farm. And there was a quote from a guy named Baker way back in 1993. Because of the severity of the impacts that this chemical has on both environmental and human health, there have been many incidences where anhydrous ammonia has resulted in major injury, mass displacement, and even death among workers and communities in surrounding areas that commonly use this substance. End quote. These incidents happened not only from the distribution of the ammonia on crops, but also from other factors such as how the chemicals are stored, and we'll get to a problem with the storage, transported, and disposed of. Here's an important point I want to make, and this is another reason we need to care. These issues affect certain populations way more than others due to the low income and inability of the workers at these facilities to fight for their own rights. A blunt way of putting this would be that immigrants often feel powerless in these situations. The link I'm putting in the show notes details the risk factors involved for farm workers who make a lot less income and are a lot less powerful than corporations who spray the stuff. These farm workers have suffered third-degree burns and some have actually died from exposure when spraying the anhydrous ammonia. I saw the pictures in the article. It really makes my stomach turn. Now the next question is, once it has been sprayed, how long does the anhydrous ammonia stay on the ground? Depending on soil temperature, pH, and moisture content, it can take two to three months or even more to convert all the ammonia applied in late summer to nitrate and then nitrogen. That's a long time for potentially bad things to happen. Here's yet another question. Does anhydrous ammonia kill earthworms that are necessary for healthy soil? Yes, they do. Although the scientific papers on how much damage it does to the earthworms are shockingly minimal. Does this anhydrous ammonia affect key microorganisms that help build vitamins and flavor compounds? I'm not sure, but I would bet the farm on it, since microorganisms in the soil rely on earthworms to break down the organics. Now, there's a USDA paper on what earthworms do, and I'll put it in the show notes. But before I discuss earthworms, I want to get back to the fertilizer. As I've stated, since the years following World War II, we have been using liquid anhydrous ammonia as fertilizer on factory farms. The American public has come to accept the fact that this potentially explosive anhydrous ammonia, once used for bombs, has become our fertilizer of choice for large-scale farming. Again, some guy thought this was a good idea. The rest of us, I guess, have come to accept the notion that there is nothing that we can do to stop it. We'll never say never, folks. Back in April 15, 2013, we here in the Boston area and around the country were all shocked to watch the Boston Marathon bombings that killed three people and injured over 100 others. During which should have been a joyous occasion. Two days later, there was an explosion at an anhydrous ammonia fertilizer plant in West Texas that killed 14 people and injured 200 others. 
it was not the lead story, even on the day it happened. This plant in West Texas stored over 100 times as much ammonium nitrite as Timothy McVeigh used to kill 168 people in Oklahoma City back in 1994. This plant in Texas had no sprinklers or fire barriers, and Texas law allowed for a grammar school to be built across the street. But I'm getting ahead of myself. I'd like to back up and explain why this fertilizer is made. Basically, all plants need lots of nitrogen to grow quickly, and this ammonia can be manufactured cheaply. Keyword there is cheaply. We all are familiar with the obnoxious smell of liquid ammonia when it's used for cleaning floors. They use intense heat at high pressures to liquefy and concentrate the gaseous ammonia. So to recap, ammonium nitrate bomb material is subjected to intense heat at high pressures. What could possibly go wrong? Just a tiny leak of this stuff can become explosive and cause chemical burns, and it can potentially damage the lungs of workers. On that day in April 2013, a small fire at the plant from leaking gas melted the stuff in the tanks. The release of ammonia, both gas and liquid, transitioned to the actual detonation of a bomb. People who witnessed it said it looked like an atomic bomb was detonated at the site. Okay, so here's my next question. How can manure, or even garbage, turned into compost, be more unpleasant than that? And that's a rhetorical question, by the way. I was discussing this issue with my imaginary friend here, Minnie Jean, and we are basically in agreement that perhaps we need to go back to traditional farming, and yes, even local farming. Not 100%, but to some extent, whatever we decide that it should be. And we can vote on this stuff, because we're still allowed to vote in this country. There certainly seems to be a trend in that direction. Any solution will involve some major changes, both in our thinking and in our buying behavior. But what is the alternative? Giving up and going to Mars? I don't think so. The few people who plan to go to Mars because we're ruining this planet, might disagree. But they're not coming back, sad to say. I hope they know that. Back to the earthworms. I didn't forget about them. So how about using earthworms to do some of the fertilizing for us? The key word there is earth. The other key word being worms. The worms shred the residues from food, and that stimulates microbial decomposition, and that results in nutrient release and flavor compounds. Worms produce casts that are rich in nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, and other nutrients. They aerate the soil and improve moisture holding capacity by burrowing vertically. They may reduce the incidence of disease by moving the soil around and they improve root growth by creating channels lined with nutrients. There's another USDA article on that I'll put in the show notes. Now, you can do your part and encourage earthworms in your garden this year. You can start by shredding old coffee grinds or tea grinds, then water the ground to bring up the worms to the surface. You can throw banana peels, eggshells, and other compostable materials with water in a blender and blend it up, then turn it into the soil. Or you can just buy earthworms at your local bait and tackle store and seed your garden with them. Or if you've just done your nails, you can buy compost. So let's eat plenty of produce and start composting. That's all I have for you today. Be well and stay tuned next week or month for another episode of Healing Outside the Box. Mm -hmm.